Goose. Never been to E3 before, have you? No, but has always been a dream of mine. Gaming's mecca. Ever since I was a kid, actually. I had a magazine. Yeah, set. yeah, calm down, rookie. Get in. <laughs> All right, what's first? Uh, registration, or maybe we should prep some questions for interviews? Oh, so much to do. Cool it, man. It's hours before the conference. You've got a lot to learn. I doubt it. I've memorized the schedule. I know everything that's happening. Seriously, ask me what's happening. Goose, E3 is more than just a schedule. It's about the city. It's about the people. It's about the streets, man. This is your training day. <laughs> like the movie? Yeah. I'm Denzel. You see, the streets, Goose, the streets call to you. Take a big breath, what do you smell? The ocean? That's right, the people. Feel the people, learn the people. Where are we now? I'm not sure, but we're on the streets, that's for sure. There's these stop signs in the streets, but this city never stops. These are great. Pick them up off the streets. Oh, this is a dead end. Life's a dead end, Goose. Sometimes you can only go right. Even when you're going wrong. The streets call to you. You just gotta pay attention. You gotta pay attention to what's what was I saying? <sighs> Smell that goose? That's E3. Let's get our game on. Oh, and we are running very late. What? Come on, goose. Come on. It's all about the schedule. We've got to pay attention what to the schedule. What about the streets? Don't worry about the streets. F*** the streets. <laughs> okay, Bajo, I'm ready for some hands-on time with some pre-release games. Hold your horses, Goose. We've got two days' worth of press conferences first, starting with EA. Strap yourself in for some corporate spin. We're inviting you in to play. Protect the pilot. <laughs> Leaving the Milky Way galaxy to help humanity find a new home. Give me it. Just give me it. I want to stay and fight for my place. We will set the stage and invite you into the forest. If you know this, sing along with me. I'm excited to confirm single player. Goose. What was your highlight? Highlight would have been Titanfall 2, although yeah. my ears are still ringing from that trailer. <laughs> the grapple hooks. Grapple, the grapple, grapple hooks. is back. Grapples just always yep. make me happy. Yeah. And single player now, and it, there's going to be a Titan with feelings, I yeah. think. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be emotional. <laughs> it's going to yeah. learn how to love. Trust me. What about you? I, I really like this Battlefield trailer. You're excited cool. by that. Yeah, yeah. It just, um, I don't know, the way they kind of, kind of move through all the different locations. They have these behemoths crash into the ground and they yeah. talked about destruction because they've paired it back and made it strategic over the years since like Bad Company 2, but maybe they're going yeah. a bit bigger with it. I'm excited about Star Wars, but they, and they showed like a bunch of the devs make, working on the new Star Wars game. There's Criterion, there's Respawn, yeah. there's um, uh, Visceral. They're all going to make great stuff, I'm sure. But where was the games? No games. There was no games. They spent a lot of money and effort on that behind the scenes video, yeah. and it looked great. Yeah. But put that effort into the trailer or some concept art. That was where I saw the spin. I saw the yeah. real spin of that. Bit of a there. wank factor there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mass Effect, though. <sighs> yeah. Just give me it. Imagine distant star systems with remote and hostile planets. We made it. Maybe we should have come earlier. Bethesda had a pretty kick-ass show last year. I'm wondering how they're going to top it, Goose. I don't know, but I think everyone's going to be pretty excited because this queue is huge. That's how they're doing it. They're just building anticipation. Sure. With the queue from hell. <laughs> <laughs> if we make it in there. I need ready, guys. I've got ticket ready, guys. Goose! We did it. We made it. We're in. We made it through the line. Wait, there's another line. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yes, Quake is back. <laughs> Here is the world's first look at what we've been up to. Good morning, Morgan. Today is Monday, March 15th, 2032. You awaken aboard Talos-1, a very special space station. Good morning, Morgan. 
Looks like we have some tests to run through today. You discovered moves and combinations of powers that we didn't even imagine. We have some Bethesda VR over here now. And if you thought survival mode was an intense way to experience Fallout, you ain't seen nothing yet. Explore the vast world of Tamriel with no level restrictions. Good morning, Morgan. You're not going to like what I have to say next. That was the Bethesda conference and uh, Quake! I'm pumped about Quake! I don't care that it was just like a pretty average trailer. I just want to play more Quake. At 120 hertz with unlocked frame rates. You were making a lot of noises during that trailer. <laughs> I made the most noise during the Prey trailer. <gasps> I thought that game was dead and buried. Oh, yeah. That is not the game I thought it was going to be. Prey 2 that got scrapped. That was a twisted, dark, weird, confusing game and I want to find out more about it. You know what? I was even excited about Elder Scrolls Online. Really? Yeah, absolutely. No. Because of the, you know, the whole level cap. There's no level thing anymore. How's I don't that gonna understand work? that. I don't understand. That's gonna that. be like normal care. Skyrim. You just go out there and experience things, and some stuff's gonna be a bit tough. Yeah, I'm even pumped for that. Fair enough. They made me care about Elder Scrolls again. Wake up. Wake up, Juice. You're okay. Xbox. Xbox. I'm pumped for this. This is this looks like this is the biggest one so far. Yeah. There's yeah. gonna be. Fat music, fat <laughs> announcements, and a slim Xbox. Today, we will show you how we are creating more choice in your gaming experience than ever before. Whoa. Whoa. You buy the game digitally, you get to own it and play it on both Xbox One and Windows 10 PC. Kate's mother, Reyna, has been abducted by a monstrous new threat, the Swarm. You look like you need to pick me up. Oh, come on. You'll be okay, right? <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to Australia. Yeah! Woo! Karen will be playing on Xbox One S and Terrence on PC. Co-op is just that easy. We're getting my mother back. And then we're burning your goddamn fucking ground! So we've been talking to our friends and asking them what they want to see from us. I'm really excited to share what we've been working on. This is the console that developers asked us to build. They wanted a console that had no boundaries. It's going to have eight CPU cores, ah. over 320 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, ah. putting greater graphic fidelity in the hands of the world's best creators. That was the Xbox conference. They knocked it out of the park. Wow. New console goose. New console, they did it. That's they crazy it. force, they did it. It was insane. <laughs> I can't believe they've announced a new console so close. It's just such a bold move. The cross-platform play. That's just going to be the most amazing thing to have. Just the dream. Favorite game, what was, what was the one that you just went, this is it? Forza Horizon Yes, 3. in Australia. Yeah, set in Australia. And we had the devs sitting right next to us. And they were quiet the whole time, but like, you could sense a bit of anticipation. And then Dead Rising and uh, more zombies. Zombies. Zombies, zombies. zombies are back yeah. as well. This, this is what I wanted from a press conference. It, it totally delivered. Yeah, yeah. I got hyped. I got teary at one point. The music. Oh. dancing crab and a baby bird with a paper collar that you could only be at the Ubisoft E3 press conference. Welcome. All of this takes place in the largest action adventure open world Ubisoft has ever done. Line us up for war, please. We have full power. Hanson, as soon as you can get us the hell out of here, I'd be most here grateful. Here we go. The flight mechanic is super innovative and it gives you that real freedom of flying in VR. From our studio windows, we are surrounded by the mountains and they have inspired us to develop the game that we are here to show you today. Here is the man who was rocking the VR headset way before VR even existed, Mr. LeVar Burton. Desperation drives us to war. It is trust that can end it. Bardo, I don't know how Sony are going to top dancing giraffes. Yeah, I don't know, Goose. They're going to have to bring out some pretty big games. Oh, like this one.
at Sony's press conference. That was a pretty good conference. You know what? It gave me lots of feels. I felt emotions I wasn't ready to feel. Firstly, from God of War, from Kratos. <laughs> it was emotional. They yes. were getting really sad near oh, the end. He wasn't was like expecting a, that. He's like a father figure with a beard <laughs> and he's all sad about helping his kid and the poor thing and God of War is making me feel things. I... And then days gone, I got feels again. Uh, I wasn't ready for feels with that. I think it was a bit. That was a bit of a douchey biker game, but uh, yeah, I know they had some strong games they started with. Yeah. And then up, uh, look, Last Guardian. I'm going to get emotional about that because I'm seeing a, a release date there finally, and I'm yeah. still not sure if I believe it. <laughs> but uh, look, seeing those big beasts and that little boy running around, I still really can't wait to play that game. So my I'm happy emotion, to see that. My emotion to that one is, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so we saw a whole bunch of VR games for the first time. Real games, really. They were VR. solid games, weren't they? They yeah. said 50 games, and you think a lot of them are going to be little. Party games, but they were real solid games. You never need to take it off. Uh, and then Hideo Kojima coming out, a, a new very confusing game. Yeah, we were confused by whatever this PT kind of thing turned into. Uh, yeah. Four four people in space, uh, a male birth, uh, crabs and fish. I'm in. Okay, Goose. Now we are officially hyped. It's time for us to hit the show floor. Yes, finally, I'm looking forward to these games and chatting to some devs. And I'm going to hug those devs, if they'll let me. Come with me! Time for Forza Horizon 3, set in Australia, mate. I've always wanted to take a Lamborghini out on the roads. Oh, there's a kangaroo, get them! Oh, so close! Why Australia? Well, you should know what an amazing country you're from, right? Um, it's vast, it's beautiful, you've got outback, you've got rainforest, you've got the amazing Gold Coast. It's incredibly diverse. The graphics, it's so beautiful, the reflections on the bonnet and on the... It's just amazing. How do you achieve such fidelity? We actually have two teams working on Forza. Both teams work on and are always improving the same technology base. So great minds in Playground, great minds in Turn 10 are always finding new and better ways to, uh, to draw things, right, to render things. But it's a lot to do with the work our team have done back home who have just been soaking in all the reference, um, soaking in all the, the imagery of Australia and, and recreating, I think, incredibly faithfully. It looked very seamless the way you've integrated the multiplayer and, and having this campaign. How, how does it actually work? We actually started this process on, on Forza Horizon 2. You know, you can find your friend with a button press, you can accept his invite and then you're, you're into that game and you're playing together seamlessly. As soon as you join, the game synchronizes time of day and weather and the traffic conditions and the drive avatars, uh, and you're just seamlessly, without even stopping your car, you're playing co-op with them. Look like there's more variety in the vehicles now. We have more than 350 cars. Obviously, the Lamborghini Centenario was just announced in Geneva in, in March of this year. It is as hot off the presses as a car can be. Uh, but we also showed you some incredible off-roaders as well, which is perfect for a lot of the really undulating and, uh, and rugged terrain that you'll find uh, in Australia. Thanks so much for joining us. Not at all. Thank you. It's been Thank fun. You. One more. Come on. <laughs> we can do it. Oh, It's fine, we're good, we're good. I've worked on all the Quakes, so I designed the original shareware episode for uh, Quake 1. Did about 28 Quake 2 maps, a lot of the Quake 3 maps, and so yeah, I've, I've, I've had Quake in my blood. I've lived in your world. Yeah. <laughs> I've shot my friends in your world. Uh, why are you bringing Quake back? Quake is such an important part of our industry. Like, it was the very first client server action game, one of the very first games to pioneer competitive play. And we want to hit that core multiplayer, PC-focused game that really has made Quake, you know, the icon that it was. Uh, is, is it like different classes or different like loadouts and setups now? Quake Champions has classic Quake gameplay, but what we've done is we've evolved it and we've uh, we created champions. So we know that everyone plays first-person shooters differently. Some people are very offensive, some people are defensive. What we are doing is we are designing champions that will fit into your play style. What is it about this Quake in particular like, you know, that is really important to you? So uh, this Quake takes a lot of the best things out of all the Quakes and brings them together. When people think of Quake, they visualize that kind of 
Lovecraftian world of Quake One, where you know this this gothic industrial type feel. But when they think of the gameplay, they think Quake Three with you know the twitch and the air control and the strafe jumping and the, and uh, so what we've done is we've taken what people visualize of Quake and what people remember playing into one game, and then we've added you know of course the the champions on top of that. Can I just give you a hug for bringing so much joy, <laughs> so much Quake joy to my life over the years? Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>Andromeda, the next chapter in the Mass Effect series, what can you tell me about it? It's definitely our biggest Mass Effect game to date, um, uh, but it's also a chance for us to uh, really rethink uh, some of the mechanics and some of the things we'd done uh, on the previous trilogy. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about how the trilogy was the story uh, of a hero becoming a legend, uh, Commander Shepard, but now actually we have a chance to do something that's a little more open, a little chance to say, where do we want to start a story for, for our new heroes? The idea of going to a whole new galaxy that humanity has never been to, uh, really, you know, evokes in everyone's mind this chance of being the first boots in the ground on any planet, right? And that's something you didn't really have in, in Mass Effect as much, uh, but now that's front and center, and that exploration, that sense of being uh, the first humans to be anywhere, uh, which is so so primitive, right? So primal to all of us. Uh, it's going to be there right in the, at the heart of the game. We've brought back some of the races that you know and love from the previous games, the Asari's there. We had a Krogan in, our, in, uh, in this one, a Krogan in our last one. So that's a chance to have all that there. Uh, so that familiarity should be there, and, and the things you know and love about those races and the things you've come to accept about them will be there. So much of what we try to do with our characters is create a connection uh, to the player, uh, especially when you're role-playing, and so I think that's coming through stronger than ever. When we had the uh, Mako and Mass Effect 1, and then we stepped back from it for Mass Effect 2 and 3, we threw the baby out with the bathwater there. There was a lot of, there's a lot to love and to hate about the Mako and the original Mass Effect 1. We want to fix the problems we had with it and then uh, get back to that sense of tearing across an alien landscape and feeling like, wow, this is... This is, this is amazing. Do you see, sense there's a bit of a theme currently with games that you're getting these big open worlds that are very vast but that are also very mysterious? Oh, I think absolutely. I think the technology we have now, a lot of, a lot of games have, is affording them that chance to do that now. Uh, players really want that freedom now. They want to self-direct. They want to go where they want to go. Uh, and then at the same time, they want to engage in the story uh, when they want to engage in it. They want that story to be epic and grand and emotional and all those things. I was surprised and excited just to see like uh, how much there was to do in just one encounter. Talk us through some of the, the mechanics of the fights you'll be having in this game. The combat is very tactical. I think that's one of the things we inherited from, from the kills on series that we worked on. You prepare before going into combat. You can you know, set traps, you can trip wires, you got all those things. Or you can keep the combat long range. You can approach your, uh, your enemies, the machines from a distance, on a mount even. What I loved about the creatures especially is that they, they seem really mean. Like something about the mechanical nature of them and the red eye, you know? Most of the machines in the game are animalistic. Uh, but the one that you call mean, the Corruptor, that's, a, that's an, an old world machine and that is vicious and it actually it, it shoots these venom spikes, the corrupting spikes into other machines, makes them go mad completely and more aggressive and, and, and random and unpredictable. Uh, but some of them you know, live in perfect harmony with themselves un unless something happens. Must be so much fun, like coming up with all the the, the um, old school kind of weapons, you know, like the rough yeah. non-mechanical weapons. At first glance, those weapons do seem rather simplistic. It's a bow against a giant machine, but if you pay close attention to it, you actually notice that they are made up of machine parts, and she will loot the machines. That's part of the core loop of the game, and she will build, you know, modify her weapons, craft her ammo. It may be seemingly. Uh, unadvanced, but there, there's a lot to the weaponry that she's got at her disposal. What I love most about this game, of what I've seen so far, is, well firstly it's got a female lead character. It's set in this world uh, that I haven't seen before, with creatures I haven't seen before. Why, why are you making this game? We really just wanted to make a very beautiful game this time. Uh, not beauty as in the gritty, kind of destroyed beauty sense, but more a world we want to be in ourselves. And that beautiful landscape, that lush nature, but also arid deserts and snow-capped mountains is offset by these machines and that juxtapose I think is very interesting. 
just like that the tension and the juxtapose between the smaller and very agile alloy versus these very large and aggressive uh, robotic machines. So these, I, th I think a store in a world works really well if you've got some contrast and, and some you know, collision course between, between storylines as well. That works magic. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate Boom. it. Thank you. So if I like made quick movements, quick movement. probably not, no, okay, yep, no, all good, all it's good. Okay. Just, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a big Battlefield fan and I had a hands-on with Battlefield 1 and my first reaction was, this is delightfully bleak. Tell me about why you chose to do World War 1. When we started this project, uh, coming out of Battlefield 4, uh, we knew that we really wanted to do something different. There's a couple of guys inside the studio who have been wanting to pitch this idea of a World War 1 Battlefield for many years. Starting out was this, but hmm, a little bit of rejection, but as a kind of pitch and I started to kind of puzzle the pieces together, I was just like, actually, this is a really, really good idea. Okay, I need to kind of do more research. Uh, I started reading and, uh, and I was blown away by all the things I did not know. The weapons fascinate me because they, um, you know, they're old clunky weapons, you know, slow reloads and, and old school bullets, but it's, it still feels like, they still feel really responsive, you know, so there's like modern elements. So how do you balance that kind of thing? The game is a sequel to Battlefield 4. So we kind of keep working. So it's the modern shooter in its core, and then and then embrace the flavors of the of the weapons and the, and the gadgets and vehicles that we had uh, available in that time. The planes aren't flying in like thousand kilometers; they are actually flying in close to the real speeds. So everything feels more grounded. Okay, I'm in the back seat of a light plane. We worked it out. <laughs> and another thing is that when these weapons were introduced. They were the top of the art. They weren't like rusty things, like the things that you see today in the museums. They were like right off the mill, like really polished stuff. That was the high end, that was the Apple products of their time. So we want them to actually feel a little bit like they were the top of the line. Why horses? <laughs> Why not? We never had horses in Battlefield. That was part of this era as well. So we felt like, yes, we must add horses. And it had some new kind of unique gameplay as well. So yeah, you'll be using horses both in the campaign and in the, on the multiplayer. What do we see for me? No, you're not, buddy. <laughs> I love that, you know, even in the 64 player battles, like, I felt like I was still having all these little one on one kind of like, it felt just there were all these little strategic battles happening everywhere. Mm. And that felt really organic and lovely. You'll be having everything from these huge open battles, like uh, similar to what you played today. Uh, everything down to kind of small, uh, urban, more tight combat, infantry focused, and everything in between. What's this battlefield to you? Like, what's the core of it? This is becomes very subjective, I suppose. But yeah, to me, it's um, the battlefield game that really sucks you in. You know, I'm always seeing problems, but I'm, at some point in time, I'm actually losing myself in the game. Uh, and that's that's been a while since that happened for me. Uh, you know, I've been playing Battlefield since forever. So when that happened, that was a pure magical moment for me the first time. And that, yeah. you know, that's uh, something I'm really proud of. And I'm, I'm, I hope that people kind of feel the same when they when they play. Thank you for making Battlefield one. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Can I just give you a look? Yes, you can. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Breathe it in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at the way it just moves up and then goes back down. All right, let's go support. Well, looks like I've lost Barjo to Battlefield, so I'm gonna go and check out EA Play. This is the first time EA has broken away from E3 and opened up their event to the public. Why the move to a big public event, first of all? Well, it's, you know, EA is a player's first company and this is our opportunity to do something new. This is, this is kind of interesting in this industry because you get to have this mid-year moment where you, everybody looks ahead mm. to what's coming in the fall and holiday season. And so why not make that an opportunity for gamers who want to get excited about what's coming to be as broadly accessible as possible. Do you think eventually we're going to start seeing more events like this where it's less, you know, VIP, less media? I hope so, to be honest. Like, uh, I, because like I said, I don't have an E3 badge, so I can't sit here and go into E3 and whatnot, but this kind of like helps fill that little void because I don't get to go in, so. Yeah, like, we just drove in like two hours ago, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's been pretty great so far. I got to meet some friends that I've actually gamed with uh, for like a year now and we got to meet each other face to face. I want to be like a good um, game designer or make games one day, so um, I, my teacher recommended me to come to this, so I thought it'd be fun. Is this a sort of company-wide sort of ideological shift that extends just beyond conventions? It's exactly that. It's exactly <laughs> a company-wide ideological shift. We bring players in earlier and more often than we ever have before, but it's, it's yielded such great dividends for us. And also for our game makers, it's really valuable input. You know, we typically do 
tours and we, we talk to press and we do all these different things, but when you can get players uh, in the software looking at the game, giving feedback on the floor. That's the thing I'm the most excited about because that's the proof. When the players play the game and the feedback they give us now, that's the real thing. So we don't help them at all, we don't answer any questions, we just say, do what you would do at home. And then they go and they play for a while, you know, and we get different reactions, we are often surprised by the results. Most of the questions I'm getting are from more traditional journalists who are actually asking the question, is this, is this a sign of what's to come? <laughs> but I think we feel that um, there's enough room for everybody. Like this, this rising tide of what we're doing with E3 around EA Play, this is good for journalists. You know, in my opinion, when you're holding something that's this important to an industry that's growing this much, it's got to be progressive. It needs to be changing. It needs to be growing. And we frankly hope this experiment is something that everybody will benefit from. This will just continue to become a progressive event and a, and a wonderful time of year for gamers to celebrate. Swarm just keep coming. Yeah, and that wind flare is getting worse. I say we wait it out. We can't. Not if we're going to save Raina. Matt! This looks awesome. So what's the pressure like being a game designer for a, such a big franchise like Gears? I mean, it's a dream come true, right? Like, uh, when you're a designer working on something like Gears of War that basically helped define the way third-person shooters have been working for the last decade, it's pretty much like what you hope for. Um, there's obviously a bunch of nerves that come with it. You're taking over someone else's baby. Um, people love it. You want to be really careful that you're staying true to the DNA of the franchise. And you also have to find ways to add add to it and make it feel updated and new. I want to know about the story. Where does this sit sure. in the whole scheme of things? We decided to place this game 25 years after the end of Gears 3. These are new characters. Our squad is JD, Della, and Kate. It's Marcus Phoenix's son. And it's one night in the wild as they discover this new threat. It seems to be just a lot more action and kind of puzzle elements when you're moving around from point to point now. Well, one of the big focuses of Gears is obviously cover. Like, more than any other game, cover is critical to you for your strategic choices and also for us, how we lay out the battlefield. So, one of the ways uh, we wanted to approach the gameplay in Gears and make it feel a little bit different was to make sure there was lots going on around cover. So, we have, we have the pods that you can kind of like drop and pop, and they have enemies that come out of them sometimes. We have the nests that you can explode and they become cover. What's like the one thing that you love about this Gears? Like, what really is it for you? It's important to us that people, when they play it, they say, oh, that felt like Gears. And I think when people touch it, they go like, that felt good at Gears, but there was all this new stuff that I experienced in it, whether it's the characters, the new enemies, the new weapons, just a new setting, a new story. What's it like building a cross-play game like this between PC and console? And what do you think of the concept overall? I love it. And getting that cross-play relationship, I think that's mostly about recognizing that our gamers, they're not bound to one device to make sense for us to embrace, you know, especially PC and Xbox. This is cool. It's now in San Francisco, uh, and we have the whole Bay Area. So imagine being a hacker in Silicon Valley with all the tech giants. The stories that come out of that are amazing. Okay, people, this is strictly by the book. Don't paint outside the lines and stay frosty. Uh, hacking has been improved, so better, deeper hacking, more options. A uh, brand new story, brand new character, brand new uh, theme. Uh, and we're bringing co-op in the box. You can press a button, now you're in co-op. Just like that. No matchmaking, no complicated interface. They're up to something. I'll see what. But what are you most excited that people are going to get out of this game? As a hacker, you can see the systems, and now you can actually manipulate the system. For an example, you see, you see a bad guy, you know, you can send the cops to arrest him. You know, and then the simulation takes over and you have no idea what's going to happen. So this guy might fight back, he might run, his friends might fight. As a player of the game, what is your guilty pleasure? Is there something that you get the most fun out that you probably shouldn't be doing? And creating Havoc and Chaos is really fun. Yeah. And it gives you a lot of opportunity to react in very creative ways. If you don't get out of there, they will kill you. Get out now. When people ask me what's your favorite game of all time, I always say Resident Evil 1. You know, I'm such a fan of the genre and the influence this game has had. And this is, you know, starting from scratch again. They're rebuilding it from the ground up in, a, in conceptually, in a design point of view. It's all first person. But also the VR element, 
you know, I, I always get motion sick in every VR game and I get a bit queasy at times, but that's just part of, you know, the technology. That aside though, incredibly uh, strange to be standing there and like see a creepy thing walk and then like flicking my head around, hearing noises. It was a new thing. I've never experienced that kind of thing before. There was a lot of new emotions and new connections to a, a genre that I haven't had before. So it's very exciting. And you can play the whole game in VR or not VR. So that's also uh, a good option because I want to play this whole thing and not vomit. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not worrying at all. Just some, uh, some uh, hanging little dolls, that's fine. Probably some heads and bags in the fridge, that's okay, I'm fine. I'm okay, I'm having a good time. And of course there's a microwaved crow, that's what you want. I could really do with a tiny up. <laughs> what was that? Okay, it's quite a unique experience because like uh, you've got that, I'm hearing noises and then I turn. You know, I've never had that in a game where I turn my head before. It's always you do it with the controller, but now I like I'll hear something, I'm like, ah! that's cool, that's really unique. I think when a game has a legacy of 25 years plus, you've kind of got to look at things a bit differently to freshen things up, uh, keep things interesting. In terms of that sense of dread uh, and slow burn horror, which is what survival horror needs, first person allows you to just do some things in terms of actually really, really messing with the, the, the player's head a little bit. So for the door, use the key, come on. It's fine, let me help, let me help. And the experience is, uh, is very, it's kind of terrifying in, in different ways in terms of uh, yeah, your setup as a, as a viewer. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty upset by it so far, so that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I could hear the screaming <laughs> from next door, so. <laughs> <laughs> The game is an uh, online multiplayer game in an open world where you can play in the Alps that are based in France, Italy, Switzerland and Austria. Uh, your studio is down, surrounded by mountains. Was that the inspiration for this game? Yeah, yeah. It's true that we are very well situated at the base of the Alps and we are surrounded by mountains. And the passion of the studio is really skiing. So during winter time, every Tuesday afternoon, we head up the mountains as we ski together. And we've always been dreaming about doing this kind of game. And we got the opportunity to do it, so we grabbed it. Taking on a snow sports, it's quite, it's quite tricky. A lot of people have tried to tackle it in the game, and there's a sort of a level of arcadeness versus realism. Where does this game sit in between there? So this is an action sport game, and I think we're taking it, it's a new sort of genre, and we're taking it to another level than the former uh, skiing games. Yeah. It's not only a proper skiing game. So you start with uh, exploration, and then you can start your challenges. And it's about the more fame you get, the more points you get, and challenge the other players if you do a really cool ride or a cool jump and push that to your friends so that they can play it as well. Yeah. And will we see any Australian mountains in it, possibly in the future? I cannot answer that question, but <laughs> I, I would hope so. Yep. Uh, so I have a very personal feeling with the Australian uh, skiing resource as I spent time in Threadbow. And I really, really, really wish one day I could, could go back to Threadbow. I really, really like the feeling of it. I love that the skiing actually feels like you're getting some resistance from the snow. Yeah, and I like the fact that you can actually like walk to the top of the mountain to start. So it's going to be a simulator more than just an arcade racer, which is what I've always wanted in a ski game. So Titanfall 2 is fun. I had a really good time. Thank you. Tell us about why you chose to like put kind of more abilities in the classes and, and, and mix it up and add new classes. Right, one of the things we wanted to make sure was that we focused on actually deconstructing the game quite a bit when we first started out and we wanted to rebuild it from the ground up, mainly for reasons of depth. We wanted to make sure that players really understood that they could make interesting choices, that they wouldn't hit that skill cap right away. One example of that is like we took the Titans and we took the Titans and we made them very uh, hero or class based where you have a Scorch, a fire themed Titan. You have an eye on a laser themed Titan. Out the chest, right? Out the chest, oh, a laser so cannon, right? <laughs> but the point is that players can now actually see that Titan go, I know what that Titan does. Here we go, here we go. Oh, I just love how you can like jetpack and jump and climb up things and... Oh! Yeah. <laughs> multiplayer for me, it's all about stickiness. It's about that 
having those interesting choices and good designs about reducing things and reducing complexity by keeping the depth of the experience there so that you, you have a lot of like room to grow as a player. With single player, they're going to get a fully crafted single player experience. It'll have all the bells and whistles that you'd expect in a shooter campaign. One of the initial really hard parts that we grappled with for a while is how do you translate that multiplayer loop into a single player game. Each designer kind of went off on their own little vision quest and they came back with an idea of like, oh, here's how you could do a mission structured around like the Vortex Shield. Or here's how you could do like a mission structured around like, I'm with a Titan and I'm riding on him. And we took all those little bits and constructed single player story missions around them. Carefully written, but still totally playable experience. I can't wait. Over the years, I've seen heaps of E3 press coverage, and I've always wondered, with the massive crowds, they can't all be registered media and tradespeople, can they? I mean, who are these people? Who are you guys? We don't know. We just <laughs> we randomly toys. walking around here. <laughs> I'm a researcher for university. Oh, I'm an architecture major. Uh, IT. I'm an animator. I'm doing video coverage. Well, I'm a paid live streamer by Blockade Studios. I currently work for a telecom company, but I used to work for uh, an indie game studio. I come to E3 every year just to try and meet some people and see what's new. Um, hopefully a lot of that other opportunities and networking. Uh, just checking out everything, see all the new technology and stuff like that. I'm doing a video coverage, uh, so I'm just taking footage of like uh, the finished product. I'm doing Facebook Live videos throughout the day. Is your company doing anything here at all? Or no. is it just sort of a way to actually get access? Yeah, get access. They were giving out like tickets for the fan fest, and then right. we had to stay there the entire night because they gave free tickets for like the first 500 people. So you had to earn the ticket to get here. Yes. I don't have a job. I'm just um, lining up just to see the Nintendo's uh, Legend of Zelda. I've been wanting to try the uh, the Oculus like uh, demo, but it's, yeah. the line's like really long. What are you actually lining up for right now? Uh, to get a T-shirt. To get a T-shirt. <laughs> No, nah, what an eclectic bunch. Although I'm not sure I want to spend all my time in these huge queues. I wonder how Bajo's coping with it. This is the E3 of queues. This particular line is an injustice. Two. You appear feeble. I punch above my weight. Adam, you worked on Injustice 1. I'm such a big fan of Injustice. Like, it was perfect. So Injustice 2, yes, please. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> happy about that. Um, firstly, I'd just like to talk about Gorilla Grodd. Yeah. Because I, I love Grodd as a character. Oh. I love his storylines yep. and all of the cartoons and everything. Why did you choose Grodd and what do you like about him? Uh, so it was an opportunity first to introduce a Flash villain. And we also wanted to have a character, all the characters, feel distinct. So for this game, they all have different silhouettes. They all actually behave differently and they're built on different bases. So a giant gorilla was a chance to show that in an extreme. Yeah. And he's just so vicious. What do you want, Grodd? Your head on a plate. I played one round, and then I got a piece of gear. And I know that's kind of been a theme. Can you explain how the mechanic works and what it brings to the game? So that's the major sort of core innovation we're showing at E3. And that's taking the core RPG elements that everyone knows and loves and introducing them to a fighting game. So after every fight, everything you achieve, you're going to get gear custom for your character, hundreds of pieces per slot that lets you look and play the way that you want to play. So it's not cosmetic, so this is gear is going to affect how you play, like stats and that sort of thing? Absolutely, so base stats like your defense and your strength, but also each gear piece, as they increase in rarity, can have new interesting stats, like new moves that can actually be dropped in the game. Literally, the goal is to have a fighting game where you can learn to play the character over time and make it your own. That's a big move, like, you know, having advantages with gear in multiplayer. How are you balancing that and, and, and how do you feel about it? It is one of the most difficult challenges I think we've faced, and we loved it. We've been working on it for years of how to, how to make a game that our end game, our tournament crowd, loves, while at the same time letting other people play with unbalanced gear. And that's something I genuinely believe we've really, really nailed. I'm excited about the single player. I've loved the way that NetherRealms has evolved that over the years. What can we expect on that front? This time we've gone big. So the idea is 
if you are afraid of playing online, if that's not something that interests you, you'll be able to play an epic campaign experience for the entire time you want dropping gear, growing. It's going to be single player focused for those that want it, or multiplayer for those that don't, and we're going to hopefully grow people and steer them in both directions. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us, and, and thanks for bringing this game. Uh, I'm very pumped about it. Bring thank it you in. so much. Bring this it is in. awesome. This yeah. is all I wanted. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Under your leadership, we shall surely prosper. Dennis, we love Civilization. How excited are you for another Civ? Oh, we're immensely excited. The scary thing is, is our goal is to make people forget about Civilization V. Really? And that's a tall order. Yeah, that's, that's tough. That's really what we're going to shoot for. Let's talk about uh, new mechanics. You know, What are you excited about? In Civilization VI, it's all about the puzzle of how do I work this map? How do I play that map? Because every district has bonuses that accumulate uh, rather rapidly throughout the game, depending where you put them. So you start specializing cities, you're scouting around the map, and you're saying, that's a great spot for my gold generating. You know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna put my commercial hub there, and it's gonna have the harbor, and it's gonna be a trade hub, because I'm gonna get extra trade routes for all these things. It's that different way of looking at the map that makes a huge difference. The AI now is gonna be play a bit more towards their actual, the actual people? And their, their traits and motivations? Yeah, it's all, it's all about bringing the characters more to life. Um, we had AI waitings in Civilization V, so we waited them to play a certain way, but they didn't have much in the way of personality, they just had a personality waiting. So what Ed Beach really wanted to do is give everybody a historical agenda. So they played something very specific and they had a style of, of play that you could come to expect. So when you start playing with Theodore Roosevelt, for example, his historical agenda is that he doesn't like troublemakers on this continent. He wants the peace, unless it's him causing it, so of course. So if you're on the same continent with Theodore Roosevelt and there's other troublemakers coming in, you've actually got a little bit of extra protection. You've worked on a whole bunch of civs. Do you ever see yourself not working on the civ? Not yet, <laughs> because when Sid put this game together, you know, back in Civilization One, and he didn't realize it at the time, but it's this perfect piece of gaming structure to just keep trying new things and new concepts, because human history has way too many zany things happen to try out that you know, it's just limitless, the amount of things that you can actually put on something like this. I am hungry. I had real tears in that trailer. Is this an emotional story for Kratos? Definitely, I mean, God of War is being reimagined. We're looking at everything from the gameplay, the story, the characters, the setting as well. He is a little bit older and now he has a son and the Norse setting, so we have a lot of opportunities of, of places we can go with this. How is the combat gonna feel differently with this new version? One of the big things that we're changing in the game is the camera, and that's influencing a lot of our decisions. I mean, the camera is a lot more close, provides for a lot more intimate and personal storytelling. What are you doing? Now it's God is up. As well as putting the combat sort of in the player's hands, sort of empowering the player to, to kind of make some decisions in that, in that close range. We're also exploring you know, a lot of different upgrade systems and progression systems that will influence the kind of decisions we make moving forward with the combat. The introduction of the sun as well is kind of another facet to the combat experience. Uh, we are really trying to push into not just limiting the relationship of Kratos and the sun to the narrative, but really you know, bleed that into combat itself uh, and allowing the player to kind of command the sun in certain ways. The introduction of the axe, which is our new weapon, uh, being awesome, able to yeah, you know, <laughs> wield the axe, melee attacks, combos, all of that on the triggers, being able to throw the axe, transition to bare hands, bring the axe back, uh, command the sun, you know, all of these layers just, just create a really rich and, and fun combat experience. Do you find that having the sun there as an, you know, another character, it, does that help you with the storytelling? You know, having the sun there just allows us to explore that in a, at a deeper level. One, giving Kratos more dimensions other than just that rage, you know, ball of rage that people know him for, but also giving Kratos, you know, with the Norse setting, this idea of a stranger in a strange land, having to teach his son about survival, having to survive himself, and then sort of also, you know, journey and, uh, you know, through this landscape and kind of create that sense of adventure as well. I wasn't ready to feel things. I wasn't ready. You made me cry. Uh, that's great. <laughs> no, that's, that's what we're, you know, we're going to keep trying hard, keep working hard to just make sure we, uh, we do the best we can. Thanks. Thanks for bringing him back. Yeah, there Thanks you go, for man. Back. I appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's the Nintendo Zelda Treehouse Forest. Oh, I'm so excited. I've waited so long to play Zelda. The Let's line is so huge. Oh. Here we go. We're in. It's like being outside. Inside. 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 It's a magical forest of oh, mystery wow. and wonder. <laughs> this is awesome. Bajo, the castle. <gasps> it's dangerous to go alone. Take me with you. Sure. Ooh. Shall we pose? 
Oh, Goose, we've waited so many years for this, I can't wait. Let's I know, play. let's do it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, what, I should go first. I'm really. the biggest Zelda fan, I think uh, I should be playing well, this. I don't know about that, I, I'm a pretty big fan too. Where's he waking up in? Has he been in like some sort of cryogenic sleep? He's just at a day spa. Oh, right, yeah. a little bath. Why don't you take it from here, Goose? Okay. You mean the cutscene? Yes. Sure. Okay. Oh, so many chests! So many chests, but... but oh. I hope this one has my pants. Yes! <laughs> um, so one of the things I saw is that you can uh, you can set things on fire. Oh, let's give that a go. So if we run through there... There we hey. go! Oh, oh, you can jump! <gasps> Skipping... This was us! It's us <laughs> skipping through the meadow bar, though. Alright. Let's go exploring. What okay. can we find? Let's go chop some wood. Oh! oh. Nice! Oh, I the tree. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. How's it going? How's He's it going? just looking around and then... <laughs> Jump nice. attack, jump attack. You can actually put the put the game down here as well. Look at that. That looks beautiful. That sits very nicely on that too, doesn't it? Goose, I could play this on the toilet. Hey, let me see if I can climb up the tree. What? I'm climbing up a tree, Goose. That was pretty cool. Got a bit of a controller targeting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That feels pretty good. Feels pretty good. Oh, hey, guys. How would you like I to have a tree branch? Branch. Branch. Branch isn't bad. Your tree branch is badly damaged. <laughs> you probably picked oh, no. the wrong weapon. Oh, no, no, no. How's it going? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Special weapon. Now walk this way, slowly, slowly, and then press L. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like that you turned around to look at it. It's just like quickly check cool. Goose, I think you're the Zelda expert here. What did you think? Uh, I was very impressed. Yeah. Uh, I'm usually a bit skeptical about new Zelda games because they only add one or two little mechanics in yeah. it. Uh, whereas this one seems like they've got a lot of things they're going to add. So things like the climbing. Uh, looks like you can do a bit of crafting as well. Mm. Um, and it does seem like an open world crafting game. And the costumes. It looks like you can maybe switch gear up and uh, really customize the character that you've got, which is something I've always wanted. What I'm most excited about, though, is that there's a real sense of mystery. You know, there's this open world. I don't know what I have to do, where I have to go. Yeah. I instantly just wanted to get out there and head to the stuff I could see in the distance. I could see a volcano and a castle, you know, like these are pointers that I want to get to and explore. So it's already given me that inspiration of mystery. It's that Hyrule Field moment from yeah. the Ocarina of Time, but we're getting it again and this time we're kind of allowed to go to those areas. So I think that's kind of the freedom that we've all been craving. Yeah. Excellent. I'm pumped. Exciting. You know what I remember most? Riding the open road. Our developer is a, a great storyteller. The depth of the story in the game is, is going to be evident, and he likes to see a lot of interaction between the main character and supporting characters as well. So you're an artist on this game. Tell us about what your concept is for this world, building this post-apocalyptic world. It's a post-pandemic world, so it's uh, about two years after something happened and the Freakers are infected. They're not dead in any way. They're more of a feral creature. I lead up the motorcycle and weapons department, and myself and, and my team, we created the drifter bike that you see in there, and we create upgrades that are compatible with the bike. And the same thing with the weapons. Just the look and the feel of the weapons, kind of older, dirtier, we're trying to go that way. Just started riding a motorcycle myself. I saw that and I thought, that's a cool idea. I mean, that would make sense to go around on a motorcycle in a post-pandemic world. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's easy the roads fast. are all torn up, right? They're all broken and uh, trees and cars everywhere. And that's why he chooses the bike as well. It's, it's, it's a more convenient way to travel with the world and the shape that it is these days. What do you think the game is trying to say? What kind of experience is it trying to give us? I think it's trying to give you an over-the-top, you know, kind of extreme uh, experiment, experience. Uh, the Pacific Northwest, the high desert, you know, has a lot of uh, climates. Just the other night, I think it snowed two inches up in the mountains where, where we live. So, you know, in the middle of July, you can have snow, hail, sleet, you know. So I think it's just a, the dynamic environment. It's just a big story, and we're hoping that the players love it. Fantasy games always tell grand, big stories. Can you tell us a bit about this one? The story of Final Fantasy XV is about a prince of a certain country who uh, loses his country to enemies and then has to reclaim his country. It's not just a simple tale, though. That within that tale of him taking back his country, you feel uh, his development as a person, his growth, uh, and also uh, the changes in the world, the wider world overall, and that comes all together to tell this, uh, this epic tale. It's the uh, VR integration we saw with PlayStation. Can you tell us a bit about how that's going to work? 
We haven't made uh, final decisions, but I'd very much like to give it to, uh, to people who bought the game Final Fantasy XV, maybe as a kind of DLC. What is the thing that you're most excited to get fans out there in Final Fantasy, and maybe people who aren't fans, to experience in this game? I really want for people to play the game and see that in order to tell this story, how all the elements of the game fit together. And I also think that when people have finished the game, they're not just in the game, they're maybe it's going to touch them somewhere emotionally as well. And I think there'll be something that remains with them then after playing that game for quite a while. Too many cues. Too many cues. I'm so excited to see Dead Rising come back. Uh, tell us what it is that you really love about this game. Frank's back. We love Frank. Frank's the original. He started it all. Um, so Frank's back in the game. Back at Willamette. Massive mall. Huge mall. Um, way bigger place to play. Um, Exosuits, so you can combo yourself now. Three different flavors of zombies. Oh, thousands and thousands of them on screen. The, so the regular, the horde. Then we have what we call the freshly infected that are super fast. So I'm just curious, like, how, where can you take the game from here? You know, like, because the last, the last few games, like, it's, there's just so much to do. So many combinations of things you can make. Like, how do you make a game like this more crazy and more interesting? So we did a lot of user research. We saw what the fans really like. Fans love combo weapons, so we spent a lot of time coming up with combo weapons, which is a great gig. And then we tried to figure out, what, does, who does it make sense to? Does it make sense to do Frank again? Frank is 54 years old now, but 50's the new 30. We spent a lot of time figuring out who Frank was uh, and how can we make it funny without making it stupid. Um, so what we've done is we give the player all the choice to do the stuff. We don't want to write the funny stuff. We just give you a bunch of ridiculous things to use. So you can decide how funny you want to be. If you want to do it in a chicken suit, do it in a chicken suit. You don't want to do it in a chicken suit, don't. It's set at Christmas time too, which is ridiculous because you got a candy cane crossbow and Christmas ornament grenade launcher. So we really themed it up and, and you get to go to the mall again and the mall's massive and it's full of Christmas stuff and it's really fun to use that stuff. Well, that was a slew of AAA games and waiting in lines. I wonder how Goose is handling the hustle and bustle of the showroom floor. I couldn't handle the hustle and bustle, so I'm stepping outside to visit one of the fastest growing indie publishers, Devolver, in their now famous chillaxed car park and be with my people, hipsters. I think you can tell we have a lot of fun doing what we do uh, and the people that we attract to this seem to be very much of the same mentality that they, they work hard, they make video games, but they also appreciate that it's not something you should take too seriously. We have Strafe showing in one of the Airstreams here at E3. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we rent a Hooters lot next to the convention yep. center, and we just, you know, set up shop. For us, it's this is really the perfect setup. It's uh, super convenient. We're kind of, you know, sheltered from you know all the noise and hectic uh, things that go on in the floors. Well, this is very, very different from all of the inside of E3. But I really like this uh, kind of a camp settlement thing. I mean, E3 for us uh, is is super important, and it is thanks to all the guys that are in there. Uh, they, they bring you guys here. I mean, you know, honestly, the media are not coming to LA to hang out here if there's nothing else, right? So, I mean, we are like that little annoying bird that lives on the rhinoceros and eats insects. <laughs> you know, we are a parasite, basically. We wanted to make a combat game that was really dynamic, choreographed, and physical, in which, you know, you felt the impact. Mm -hmm. And we, most of us have a background in martial arts. We love martial arts movies, so that really inspired us. Well, it's kind of an arcade-style game, so you stand in one place, but it's not boring, it's not stationary, because you have so many things going at the same time, uh, and you don't get any motion sickness or locomotion. Whoa! When it comes to, you know, the, the shooters of the 90s, you know, from probably like 93 to 98, a lot of those games played very different than the ones today. I searched the market, and there were no FPS roguelikes that really focused on the, you know, fast gameplay that felt like Quake or a game of that era, and said, why don't we make it ourselves? Do you have like a, like a favorite weapon? We don't give advice, particularly to other publishers, but we've certainly benefited from being as open as possible and letting people see things and talk to the developers and hang out with them without us getting in the way of that conversation or trying to manage any of it.
it's great that you know you get this ecosystem building around around it with uh, you know a wider variety of events than just a main show. Some people are kind of sick of the thing inside. They're looking for something new, something more laid back. So with E3, you know, it, it seems as if you're seeing a lot of the AAA publishers pulling out, starting to do their own thing. Hopefully the convention center can sustain itself. It, it brings new room for more people and the publisher starts branching out. So we're taking over more of Los Angeles, making yeah. it more of an interesting place to explore and just not the convention center. If you can engage with your fans, through YouTube, through Twitch, through Twitter, do it. Through being in a car park. But through being in a car park, yeah, literally. Dax, so good to see you again. Before we get into Batman VR, yeah. thank you for Arkham Knight. I had a very good time. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, no problem, our pleasure. We kind of made that game for guys just like, well, no, for you. We yeah, made it for you. Just for me. Yeah. yeah, good, it felt like that. And then Thanks we said so we're much. never going to make another one ever again. And now you are. Why are you making it? Because we've always kind of banged on about Be The Batman. Yeah. Ever since Arkham Asylum, we're talking about Be The Batman, Be The Batman. Like, VR is genuine. It is for real. When you put the cow, the gauntlets, the bat suit on, you're in the bat cave, like, you are the Batman. We're not kidding around anymore. It is totally for real. So we had to do it. Developing for, for VR, you've got to think really differently about how the user views their world, how they encounter challenges, how they solve problems. So. It completely changes the way you create games, and I think changes the way you play games. You know, I don't want you to spoil anything. If you do spoil anything, I'll never forgive you. I'm not going to spoil anything, <laughs> believe me. But what, can you tell us anything about the story at all? No. The setup? <laughs> Without spoiling, no! Don't spoil it's it! It's just, it's... But tell me something, don't okay. spoil it. It's more about the sense of being Batman in Gotham City and solving a classic murder mystery. It's the world's greatest detective like you've never experienced it before. All right, shall we go have a play? Yes! Ah! Ah! All right, here we go, Batman VR. Um, I'm or just in the menu, I'm happy. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. I can see the bat signal in the sky. I've got a picture of my dead family and I'm holding it and I'm looking at it and it feels incredible. I'm now looking at the bat suit. I'm about to get in a bat suit, guys. Okay, cowl on, let's do it. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, oh, I can see myself in the mirror. I'm Batman, I'm Batman. You that you would love this. I did it. I should say his hands. Dex, I was not expecting it to be this fun already. Uh huh. And you, I'm just in a have... suit. Baji, you've seen nothing yet. Okay. It's hard to even describe the sensation, but it. it yeah. But this this really is something else. It's so beautiful, man. Back streets of Gotham, right? This you is are there. beautiful. You are there. Oh. No, you're not allowed to do this. I'm so sorry. No. I'm so sorry. No, that's not. That's <laughs> mean. That was upsetting. Give it hugs. It's okay. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Do you want to sit down? That was no. I'm alright. I'll stand. Nothing has felt that solid, uh -huh. that smooth, that interesting. And it, Batman aside, like putting my bias for loving Batman aside, yep. that was just um, that was a cinematic, crafted experience. Let's go and sit down. Why did you do that to me? Sad stuff happened. That's all I'll say. Launch in three, two, one. One one is away. Brian, why are we taking COD to space? Well, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to innovate. You know, to bring Call of Duty into space, but in a grounded way, allows us to retain what's fantastic about our boots on the ground action and introduce a bunch of cool mechanics. What was it like designing a, a kind of the space kind of world? Yeah, well, we wanted to create, like I said, a grounded place uh, that felt like the rules of science, but yet pushed a little bit into that Hollywoodification of what space combat could be. But we needed speed, so we came up with a grappling hook as a way to get around zero-G environment, but also come up with some really cool takedowns. <laughs> so you're seeing things like grenades that sort of fly through there and home to an enemy. The other thing we did is we actually used gravity in as, as a grenade, so you can actually throw a gravity grenade and characters will float up in, into the air. So those are the kind of things that we're really having fun exploring when it comes to cool new gadgets and tech for uh, Call of Duty in space. I think we got their attention. And the fact that you're captain of this gigantic ship and all of the motion going on around it, really that was the most compelling thing to me is to see you in command of this awesome vessel and being able to choose missions of where you're going to go and to these different planets. And, and these choices that you make as a commander, there's a real burden of command and a, and a narrative around that burden of command. There's even a massive line to throw basketballs in a hoop in real life. That's not games, that's sports ball. 
The sports ball line goes around the block. I didn't even notice until just now. Why? It's a ball on a hoop. Go play some games. Ain't nothing for you to worry about. Let's get you upstairs. You all fan out. Watch the rest of the boat. This sure shit wasn't an accident. Mafia guys are bad guys, but it's yep. fun to play them and it's fun to watch movies about them. So how do you approach this character uh, with that in mind? Like, I'm a huge crime fiction fan. So, you know, whether it's movies like Goodfellas or The Town, I love that stuff. You know, our, our main character's name is Lincoln Clay, and he is a criminal. Um, but the important thing is to make the player empathize with him. So you create some kind of universal themes that the player can relate to. Um, in this case, you know, Lincoln Clay grew up an orphan. The orphanage shuts down and he's basically thrown out on the street. He's half black, half white, so he kind of doesn't fit in anywhere. So we put a lot of work into that to get you on Lincoln's side. That's really good to hear, you know, because like there's a lot of shooting and a yes. lot of action. Yes. So I want I want a connection to that, you know, I want a reason to be doing this action. W would you say this is a, a story at its core about revenge? It is a revenge story. What he's purposely doing is targeting Sal's organization and dismantling it and then replacing it with his own organization, which is comprised of him and then the three underbosses, Cassandra Burke and Vito Scaletta, who is the main character in, in Mafia 2. We, we wrap the game narratively as a documentary. There's documentary sections that are from the present day. So you have you know, a man in his 80s essentially reflecting back on the events of 1968. Oh, that's so cool. It took me months to figure out that Lincoln had survived the massacre and was waging a war against Sal Marcano. And this time it has such a, a magic to it as well. You know, like it's a very racially charged time, but also like the, the music and the the clothing and the cars, the cars look so beautiful. I just want yeah. to drive them all day. <laughs> I got really emotional uh, watching footage for this game. So okay. it's, I'm already very emotional about it. I can't wait to play it. All right, guys, let's do this. See, it's safe time. So Mike, lead designer on Sea of Thieves, I got a great response at the press conference, especially because of all the shenanigans. Is this the kind of game that will lend itself to a lot of uh, tomfoolery? Oh, this is the perfect game for tomfoolery. What you've seen today, like the like the drinking grog and the instruments, and that's just that's just the tip of the iceberg. It was really important for us that we show off the the tone and the charm of the world, and especially like Rare's making a pirate game, so making it feel like it's got that classic kind of rare humour as well. That was really important for us. Oh man, we can drink. We just get drunk in a pub, because that's awesome. We really want to have, like set it in a beautiful world and like yeah. make this fantastical world, and players can not only fight against other ships, but they can fight against mythical creatures as well. That fantastical world is absolutely like critical to the tone of the game. And it does seem like uh, you know you can work together, or it seems like you can not work together. Uh, was that something you guys had in mind while you were working on it? We we want to leave it up to the players for like the things they want to go after, the goals they want to pursue, the roles we assign themselves. Yeah. We want to give players a lot of freedom in this game. I want I want to sail. Oh no, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm ruining it. How do you pull up the anchor? Oh, here we go, here we go, all right. Fire or it will, unleash hell. Um, I mean, when we got the real the real players in, um, the world's about to keep part of the briefing, it was uh, the, me and the rest of the design team were watching them play for the first time. Honestly, I think we all got like tears in our eyes. I was like so, <laughs> so choked up where yeah. we were just, we threw them in there with no help, no tutorials. Like, well, basically you're a pirate, go have fun. Yeah. And uh, they were like sailing the ship within five minutes. Right on top! Oh! oh no! We're screwed! Please, please, you gotta save my little girl. Wait. You're sending an android? All right, ma'am. We need you to go. You can't do that. You. Why aren't you sending a real person? It's so nice to see you again, David. And my uh, pleasure. Detroit, this is gonna be an emotional game, I think. I hope so. I mean, uh, that's uh, what we work on. Uh, although, I mean, this first scene that we present at E3 um, is rather um, with a cold android. I mean, it's just a machine and you just want to accomplish a mission. But we will see different types of androids across the game and we are maybe even more emotional than Connor was. 
um, what drew you to this android human setting? And I believe the humans are kind of the bad guys in this story, is that correct? The game takes the point of view of androids and says, what if they were the good guys and we were the bad guys? What if humans were a race, a declining race, um, becoming more and more selfish, more and more uh, dependent on technology, maybe more and more violent? You lied to me, Connor. You lied to me. It's really challenging at many levels. The first level is to create this branching narratives. Because, you know, to give you an example, a film script is about 100 pages. Well, we work on script that there are thousands of pages. Wow. With many, many options and branches and variations of the story that combine and create even bigger variations. And you want, at the same time, old versions to be as inspired and emotional. And at the same time, you have so many of them. So this is what makes my life so exciting. A lot of work. Absolutely. <laughs> it's up to you how the story ends. What is it about this game that you love the most? Like, what, what is so important to you about this game? It has some very important questions. And I let people, you know, draw the parallels with the real world and things they, they know. And uh, I like when games give you food for thought. You know, my generation, I'm 47 now, and I certainly don't want to design the same game now than when I was 20. And when I was 20, I was just dreaming of having a laser gun in my hand and shooting at anything that moves. And when you get a little bit older, you, you start to want something else. Maybe I want to tell something I really care about. Maybe something that moves me in the hope that it's going to move other people. And I think many game designers, you know, when they reach their 30s, 40s, have this ambition of telling something that matters. I love when, when they stay in you, when they haunt you. That's what I love about games, and these are the games I try to make. My name is Connor. This is our story. And that's it. The doors have shut and it's time for us to decompress. Well, I had a really amazing time because I was super pumped to check out E3, but I wasn't sure uh, how much I was going to see around here. And it turns out that there's so much going on around the actual showroom floor. Yeah. It's almost like E3 is a bit of an organism and it's growing. And it's just adding to what is becoming a sort of festival of games for totally. those couple of days. It's spreading and, out. But what, what I really like about it is that it's showing that E3 is evolving. Yeah. And so I'm glad that uh, now I can see that it's healthy. E3 is healthy. Well, it's interesting you say that because there are a lot of queues, but that's because yeah. there was a lot of hands-on. I don't remember there being this much hands-on at an E3 before. I think that's great for the devs because they get to see the public playing their games, and I know they like doing that, but I think it's good for the event too. You know, it's an exciting event, and there were still plenty of opportunities for interviews. Yeah, I think you summed it up best. You said it's kind of like teething problems. Yeah. It, it's just like E3 wants to let more people in. Yeah. It's just trying to work out the best way to do that at this stage. Uh, I also want to talk about diversity a little bit, because last year was such a, a, a great E3 for diversity, well, for female yeah. leads in games. This year, uh, I feel like I cannot think of a single female lead game that we haven't already heard of. Maybe there's one there, but I can't think of one. I know, I totally agree. I'm so sick of seeing white males with beards, and I am one. Yeah. I agree with you, I think we could use more there. But I also feel at the same time that uh, a few franchises are maturing in really interesting ways. Yeah. Like God of War is definitely taking a more interesting Naughty Dog approach. That really excites me. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing about Zelda. I mean, that was a series that has been very childish for a long time. Even yeah. though you get more mature gamers playing it, uh, and it feels like it's finally starting to catch up because they've said, here are the things that this series has needed for a long time. What would you say was probably a highlight? You know what? Batman VR. The VR experience in that felt really design heavy, like crafted. Yeah. I'm doing things that make sense for VR. I'm not getting sick. The fidelity of the visuals, the depth of everything. I have a restored faith in VR. Not yeah. that I lost faith, but I was a bit like, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But I'm like, yeah. no, I need to play that. What about you? Probably be the Xbox conference when they announced Forza Horizon 3. Yeah. Being set in Australia just made me proud for some reason. Yeah. And then the kangaroo popped up on screen and we just all lost our minds. And yeah. it was just a really lovely moment as well. So that was wonderful. Well, that's been our E3 episode. We hope you've enjoyed it. But Goose, um, before we go, there's just one more thing we got to do. This again. Come on, mate, let's go to the streets. Not the streets. Your training's nearly complete. <laughs> Well, 
welcome to the most magical streets on earth. 